Ladies and gentlemen, in this interview, we'll be talking about Gwen and Frank's legal situation with the Department of Justice and why the books, The Art of Passing the Buck, Volume 1 and Volume 2, passed this trial by fire. My name is Howard Hinman. I have decades of legal experience focusing on transactional legal work. I specialize in intellectual property, copyrights, trademarks, and patents. Also real estate, company and entity formation, and information technology, better known as IT. I've been a paralegal since 1997. With me is Gwen Wyckoff. Gwen, please first by starting off with your corporate experience. Okay, I was, um, my early beginning, the first jobs I ever had were with corporations. I was hired by General Electric Credit Corporation as a typist, and I was promoted to a secretary from there. I worked for them for a couple of years, and then um, I had a, um, a stepmother who worked at IBM as a lawyer. She was the uh, first lawyer who was ever hired by IBM, and she encouraged me. <laughs> she said I'd get a better deal if I went over to IBM. So I went over there for an interview and they uh, hired me and I worked in the secretarial pool for three months which was way too long and I thought that it was because I was uh, not, not appreciated or I was stupid or something. Uh, so I was anxious to get out of the secretarial pool and I was asked to uh, take the place of a secretary who had a two-week vacation in the personnel department and they really liked me and they wanted me and I found out later the reason I was in the personnel pool is because they thought I was so exquisite that they wanted to save me for one of their higher executives but I couldn't deal anymore <laughs> with being in the secretarial pool I wanted to have my own desk in my own place so Anyhow, I had a tremendous amount of training in the secretarial pool. They took a great deal of time and care. And that was back in the 60s. And I remember one of the technicians coming in and demonstrating one of those, uh, the first typewriter that would do typesetting automatically. All right, that, that was a long time ago. <laughs> so uh, after that, I worked for them for almost three years, and I found out that I could not get ahead. They wouldn't uh, promote me or anything. Of course, looking at hindsight, I realized in the 60s women were not appreciated that much. So I went off and started to find other jobs, and I got myself what I call mentoring and apprenticeship for eight years. So in 10 years, I had 10 jobs, it, and included in that was uh, I became a employment counselor for a while and learned uh, from the famous company Snelling and Snelling on Wall Street. I learned how to uh, interview people and uh, find jobs and stuff like that. So I have a lot of experience in the corporate world. I understand you have some background in technical writing. Please tell us about that. Mm, then uh, th all that uh, 10 years was in um, the New York area, and uh, I went from there to Chicago, uh, and then from there to Salt Lake City where I worked for a company called Telemation, and they were bought out by Bosch Fernse, and I got promoted to the technical writing department, and I learned how to do the details, you know, how to sit and uh, listen to an engineer tell what was going on, and then I had to write it up. And you also have a background in magazine publishing. Please tell us about that. Yes, I uh, had a, a, some money, and so I decided I would do what I really wanted to do, my heart's desire. And at that time in my life, I had uh, been exposed to Philip Marsh, if anybody remembers him. It was my father that did this. He showed me this video of Philip Marsh talking about the IRS and how bad the IRS is and blah, blah. And I got sold on that, and I, he was, my father was in uh, Las Vegas, and I was there for a vacation. I came back to California, and I started hunting up organizations that were uh, about, you know, the truth about taxes and things like that, because I was so shocked. 
And uh, I ran into this state citizenship movement about uh, states' rights. And I also ran into the alternative medicine field through John Rappaport. Uh, he, I went to a lecture with him one night and he just laid out all the truth about medicine. And then my own path was pretty metaphysical. So the magazine that we published was called Perceptions about Government, Health, and Metaphysics. And uh, those four areas, those three areas, often dovetailed into each other section. So we had a, here's one of them, this is issue eight. Uh, and this one has a uh, ad in it uh, from Richard McDonald, who I'm going to talk about later, because you're going to, we know we're going to talk about the license plate thing. And so I think I'll just show the ad from Richard McDonald where he's advertising that you don't have to uh, have license plates. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the magazine, okay? Now, we're doing this video to rep attempt to replace a lost video that you did with Frank Ozak and yourself and Ben Lowry to bring this valuable information to this audience. So in that regard, please describe generally what a trust is. Okay, well, for after the magazine, Frank and I got into the common law trust business. So in order to be in that business, I had to uh, understand a great deal about all kinds of trusts. And Frank had joined the state citizenship uh, uh, organization separately from me. And when we got together, uh, we each had also gotten common law trusts. So we compared the two. I had part of it, he had part of it. And then we began the research because we thought, well, we'll, we'll really find out what we're doing here. We, you know, this is, looks kind of like it's dangerous. <laughs> you know, we, we have no information about how to use these trusts correctly, right? So we started researching and reading and putting our own trust together and from my little I don't know, I had 20 pages of mine and he had 10 pages of his. We found out there were so many documents missing, right? And so much information missing. And that was called the Declaration of Trust or the Trust in Indenture had so little of what needed to be in it. And uh, so we just started researching and putting together these trusts. Then people found out we were doing that and they wanted us to help with their trusts. So they brought in their information from whoever sold them a trust. And we got lots of data from that. And uh, we kept researching and learning and testing and opening bank accounts and dealing. And I also have a, my personal life. I have my own uh, trust background from statutory trusts. So I knew in my personal life the value of uh, trustees. And on these common law trusts, these scam trusts, they don't have trustees. They say this is an irrevocable trust, and then they made the settler or the grantor the trustee, which made the irrevocable trust a uh, grantor trust, and that's a taxable situation. So there was a whole situation with uh, the kind of trust, how you ran it, and whether you had to pay taxes or not, and uh, all kinds of court cases we dug up about that. And everybody needed a trustee. <laughs> and nobody had a trustee. So uh, we had to, uh, you know, kind of get people to learn to be trustees. And we started educating people and so on and so forth. In that regard, please give us either the regular or the embellished version of the dog story. <laughs> All right. Well, in honor of uh, Ozak, uh, Frank Ozak, who passed April 28, 2014, which is just a little over a year ago, and I've just a little over a month ago finally gotten over all the horrible grief, um, he told in the original video the story about 
a dog who was in a trust. So I'm going to retell it, but I'm going to tell it very, very embellished <laughs> to give everybody an idea what a trust with trustees might be really like. So the, uh, the dog, his name is Duke of Clubs, and he's a French poodle, and he is beautiful. He gets the training, he gets the love of two children that are the beneficiaries of the trust that he's in, and he's managed by a board of trustees who pay all his bills, and he's a show dog, so he makes money for his little trust, and he's also available for stud service. He has plenty of ladies, <laughs> <laughs> and so he gets money into his trust for that too, so he's a money-making little trust. Now he's in what's called an asset holding trust, a little box down here, and it's only the dog in the trust, nothing else. But he's managed by a bigger trust up here. This is a, this is a, a management trust, and in the management trusts are where these trustees that I mentioned before, they, they're in this top uh, square, okay? And they are managing this little square down here with the dog. Right? So the neighbor has a child who's about six years old and he's a bully, this child. So the child wants to tease the dog. So some day, one day he came over with a stick and he started hitting the dog. Well, this is a special dog. This dog is royal. <laughs> this dog doesn't get treated that way. So the dog is barking and making all kinds of noise and the People that are the trustees are running across the lawn to find out what's going on with their prize possession, and they don't get there fast enough, and the dog bites the little boy on the shoulder. Big, bad, huge, awful bite. 911 is called, the paramedics come, he's rushed to the hospital, he has to have surgery because it was serious. And then, he has to have the rabies shot and the tetanus shot and all those, right? He's going to be scarred. Well, the father, thinking that wh whoever owns this dog is rich, he's going to sue. He's going to sue for $200,000. Well, the dog being so special, he did have an insurance policy, but the insurance policy was only $30,000, so it didn't cover 200,000. And the dog is in this little trust all by itself. <laughs> the only thing left to get is the dog to bit the boy. <laughs> now, in a, let me just uh, elaborate a little bit. This management trust up here, it managed the dog in its trust. Over here in another trust is a boat. Over here in another bus trust is an apartment building, right? Over here in another trust is a coin collection. So this management trust is managing four different sets of stuff, but the guy cannot get it because each one of those little squares of stuff has different set of beneficiaries. And under the law, those things are owned by the beneficiaries. So he could only get the dog. He couldn't get the boat. He couldn't get the apartment building or the corn collection or the residential property or whatever else. He couldn't get that. Okay? Got that. Excellent. And in real life, what did happen is the, uh, there was a, in another trust company, a person put their oil wells into trust. And uh, the consultant said, uh, you should put each oil well in a separate trust. Well, they didn't want to do that, so they put three oil wells per trust. I don't know how many oil wells they had. But in real life, a child climbed over the fence and fell down into the oil well of one of them and uh, was killed. And uh, the parents, the only thing they could get was the oil wells, but that's not too bad. That doesn't hurt. Yeah. So that, that's why it's called asset separation, 
It's only available in an irrevocable common law trust, and it only works if you have trustees and beneficiaries set up correctly. Excellent. Tell us more about contrasting the common law or private trust versus statutory trusts, because you've touched on both previously. Give us more contrasting ideas. Well, some people say that because a living trust is, is something you do privately, that that's not statutory. Okay. Uh, there's called a statutory irrevocable trust that's set up by lawyers. And uh, that's quite different than the common law trust. The common law trust has what's called uh, trust capital units or units of beneficial interest. They both have a different application. The uh, statutory trust doesn't have any of that. Uh, I think the statutory trust, which uh, is, is limited to blood relationships for beneficiaries, I could be wrong, but I think that's so. Uh, irrevocable common law trust is not limited to blood relationships for beneficiaries. Tell us more about how the common law trust is a more sophisticated arrangement between the settler trustees and the beneficiaries, even for those who may not have their own children. Um, the uh, it's because of the extreme flexibility through the trust capital units. The common law trust can grow unlimited. It also is by contracts, and when the contract when the contract ends, it can be renewed. And uh, in a statutory trust, the contract ends you know, usually about three generations down the road, and uh, at when it ends, it cashes out all its corpus. Corpus is the body of the trust. It's like corpse. <laughs> okay. It's the stuff in the trust. They cash it out. In a common law trust, there can be a vote by the trustees to continue the trust or not. And so this is how the common law trust can continue and continue and continue and continue. This is how the Rothschilds, the Rockefellers, the Kennedys continue their trust. Tell us briefly about the remainder man in the statutory trust. And I know you're an expert in that field. <laughs> I'll tell a little funny story about that. I was being interviewed by the IRS, and they were uh, trying to dig into everything, and I was using my great skills to avoid that. But uh, I, so they got onto the uh, statutory trust where I was the rem remainder man, and it uh, broke up on me and five other people. And it had been held since 1900 in a bank. A bank had been a trustee in all these years. So that trust was over 100, almost 200 years old when it ended, okay? I was the third generation. And so the IRS was trying to dig into that and say something, you know, getting into the taxes and all that. And I just kept saying to them, I was the remainder man. And, and I could tell they had no clue what I was talking about. So I just kept saying, oh, oh, I was the remainder man. That doesn't have anything to do with it. I was the remainder man. <laughs> Which meant, I'll translate it for the audience, it means the only thing I received is corpus and it's not taxable. <laughs> but why would I tell them that? <laughs> All right. For the benefit of the audience, let's talk about some of the component parts. First of all, what is the settler, also known as a grantor? Well, he's God. Didn't you know? The settler is God. He creates the indenture. The indenture is the declaration of trust, and he makes up all the rules that the trustees have to follow. All right? And he's trying to make up rules that the trustees will follow, and he doesn't know the trustees, and he doesn't know the beneficiaries because he's long gone. So he's trying to put together a body of rules for the trust, the direction of the trust, what the trustees need to do under, in, un, uh, in uh, every circumstance he can possibly think of. So he is the one also who's putting in the initial funding 
So in a big mega trust, this is this is the guy with a million bucks who decides to put it into a uh, common law trust, and he sits down with his counselors and he does this indenture. It's called a trust indenture, or it's called a declaration of trust. The one that we have is 37 pages before somebody else gets in there and adds their own stuff. Okay, it's the Bible. It's the law. This is the document that the, tr the uh, judge will read if there's a dispute or lack of clarity about how the trustees should behave or act. So this is what the settler does, and he can also act as an advisor to the trustees. But once in an irrevocable common law trust, when the settler gives up his money to the trustees, the money's gone. No, he does not get it back. And... Uh, so he hires a protector to h fire the trustees if, if they violate the trust indenture. So the grant or a settler is the person that provides the funding and also the direction and intention of the trust. Absolutely. Now, you spoke about trustees. Tell us about the trustee and particularly in the common law trust. In the common law trust, the trustees have to know what they're doing. Uh, in a uh, statutory trust, I think they probably know what they they probably need to know what they're doing. In a living trust, they the person who becomes the trustee after the settlers or the grantors die, that's usually the one of the children who has the signature power and the wealth is passed on by having that signature power prior to the parents dying. All right, uh, that person usually is their only job is to uh, uh, d distribute what's in the trust. Like if there's a house there, they usually sell it and divide it among the, the siblings. Uh, but in a common law trust, especially a common law trust, you have to understand a matter of jurisdiction. And jurisdiction is tricky because when a trustee in a common law trust fills out paperwork to get a financial account or to open a bank account or to deal with any kind of contract situation. They have to be knowledgeable about jurisdiction and they have to be understanding uh, the great uh, uh, tricks of what a trust is, what a trust isn't, how to say things in the right way. They have to be highly educated. So does the settler. So does the executive secretary. You run into the problem with the beneficiaries. The beneficiaries don't have to be highly educated. They just get the money, right? They go to the mailbox every month and they get their $2,000 or whatever, okay? Uh, more on that later. <laughs> now, tell us why in the common law trust there are generally two trustees. It's because of the complexity uh, the trustees have to understand the legal and the financial, both, and they should be older people. In fact, this is a pitch for people. Anybody who wants to have an early retirement, this is where you need to go to be loved and appreciated. The older a trustee is, the better, because you have to have a lot of experience to uh, know how to handle people, know how to make investments, know how to... Uh, deal with accounting, and uh, it's a very good position for people that have a lot of experience. This is why Frank was so good at it. Frank did all the uh, trustee work for many, many trusts, and he had this enormous background. He at one time sold oil leases. He uh, one time worked in investments. He used to have an investment portfolio. He bought and sold several residential properties in his life, and he owned an apartment building. Now that is a qualified trustee, big time, okay? So this is why you need two trustees because most people don't have a, a background like that. He was our first trustee and he was training the other trustees, the co-trustees, he was training them. Tell us about how, in addition to handling the financial and legal administration of trust, the trustees are responsible to take the trust funds and multiply them. Yeah, the trustees, that's where they get their money. If they can multiply the trust funds, they get a percentage of gain, right? So 
Uh, that's their motive, and the bigger the initial pile, the more money they can make if they're savvy financially. Tell us why it's better that a trustee not have a license or a bar card, such as an attorney or a CPA. The attorneys and the CPAs are beholden to whoever gave them their license. The same with doctors or any other professional that has a license. Uh, those people can uh, pull the license uh, if they don't like what you're doing. Now, if a trustee is your, uh, is, your, is a lawyer, his first obligation is always to the court. It'll never be his first obligation to the trust. Uh, it's well known and documented in the legal field uh, that the trustee is first his first commitment is to the court it's also stated in what is it say the you know that corpus secundum the corpus secundum that uh corpus juris secundum i think is the actual proper name corpus juris secundum that any client of an attorney is an infant unsound mind or something else you know it's insulting whatever it is imbecile imbecile all right so that's what they think of you if you're an attorney, if you're a client of theirs. And uh, your obligation as an attorney is to the judge, to the bar association, to your wife, to your children. Eh, maybe your client, if you feel like it, you're going to get paid whether you win or lose. So, eh. So, you know, the question is, uh, and it's true with medical pro professions. You know, it's the same thing. I had a, I heard a horrible story one time, and this you can all just <laughs> think about this. It was a gynecologist. It was a woman, and she had to send her children, her child, to this big uh, medical school. When I guess those fees are very high, so the uh, women that came into her office, she told all of them that they needed a hysterectomy. Not because they needed it, but because she needed the money. I'm sorry, medical profession. I'm sure you know that does happen. I'm not saying they're all that way. I'm just saying some of them are that way. In that regard, please tell us about the case for a gentleman you knew personally, Dr. Richard Boylan. Oh, this was during the perceptions time. And he was a good friend and a supporter of perceptions. And he'd written about uh, ET stuff in the magazine. And I talked to him on the phone. And I found out his um, clientele was, um, a lot of it was a regression to discover the ET abductions. You know, and the, this was like the Carla Turner situation, where Carla Turner found out the same thing. She's written a couple books. She's, of course, quite dead now um, <laughs> for writing those books. Um, where Carla Turner talked about her experiences of her clients, and they were so consistent among people that didn't know each other that she investigated and found out it is our military that was, be, that was supporting and helping this, these uh, extraterrestrials coming here, abducting people and taking ovaries and semen and all that. Well. Richard Boylan had the same experience, but uh, he, he, I don't know what happened. I just know they pulled his license. I talked to him one time when he was very, very upset about that, and he couldn't make a living because of it. And uh, then the next thing I knew, about three or four months later, he had his license back. And he didn't write for perceptions after that. He was not available to us. So you can conjecture however you want. But that's a good example of they can pull your license if they don't like what you're doing. I'm certain the audience can connect the dots. <laughs> now, going back to trusts, who are the beneficiaries of the trust? The beneficiaries are chosen by the settler, who is God, you know. He writes the rules, he picks the uh, initial trustee, and he chooses the beneficiaries. So 
And not only that, in the Declaration of Trust in a, in a common law trust, he writes the rules and regulations of who can pass on the trust capital units and who cannot. Trust capital units are a percentage of the corpus of the trust. And there's all kinds of rules and regulations and it follows the bloodline or it doesn't follow the bloodline or whatever. So that's how you get to be a beneficiary. Hopefully your daddy's rich and he makes you a beneficiary. <laughs> so to recap, we have a trust, a private trust is also known as a common law trust. We have a settler or grantor. We have beneficiaries and we have trustees to take care of the beneficiaries. We also have an executive secretary who has to testify to the minutes in the trust, owns the trust, handles the trust seal, and is, um, is a witness to uh, the trustees. You have, the trustees can't validate themselves. <laughs> they have to have a witness. And so the executive secretary writes the minute, signs the minute, so on and so forth. And what about the general manager? Well, the, the settler, if they want to become involved in the trust, can become a s general manager, but do not sign anything. Don't sign contracts. Don't sign the checkbook. Don't show up at the bank. <laughs> Tell us about the function of the trust protector, particularly in the private trust. Okay, in the private trust, this is an area that is just being explored and opened uh, as, uh, and developed, actually. It started in Europe where, because the settler cannot fire the trustees, he hires somebody who can. But they can only fire the trustees if the, fire, if the trustees uh, violate the indenture or the rules of the trust. He can't just fire them because the settler's in a bad mood. So the, the protector needs to have a certain amount of legal savvy. It can't just be your neighbor or your wife or somebody. <laughs> and tell us about whether or not and why a trust protector could be a bar attorney or a CPA. Well, the settler might feel better uh, with a uh, bar attorney in that position because if the trust is sued, the protector is likely to be the attorney to represent the trust. It doesn't have to be. I mean, it's totally up to the settler what he wants to do. You told some interesting stories in, stories in the first video. One of them was about traveling without license plates. <laughs> Could you please explain that and tell us what happened? Oh, this is the back in the days when I was involved with the state citizenship movement with Richard McDonald. I'm one of those people that <laughs> goes, some, goes into it 100%. If I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. So it was a very scary thing. I uh, took off the license plates uh, of my car and uh, stuck in a dealership notice. And I also rescinded my uh, driver's license. And this was, I did this shortly before we started Perceptions Magazine. And because Perceptions Magazine focused on the state citizenship movement, it wasn't really that movement that we focused on. We uh, focused on um, jurisdiction and states' rights. And except for a part called Awesome News, we stayed away from the federal government. We just did state government things. So the... Um, uh, experience of driving around without license plates got the attention of the Culver City Police Department. But I don't think it was because they noticed that we drive around, drove around without license plates. I think they heard about it as elsewhere. So one day I come to work and the police are waiting for me. <laughs> and it's about 8 o'clock in the morning and there's two squad cars there and there's four or five policemen and I'm thinking, oh my God, they're going to take me away. <laughs> no, they wa it was a shakedown for magazines. <laughs> they wanted the magazines. They'd heard about our movement and they wanted to know about it. Well, several months later, it was another shakedown for magazines. And they said the police of Ch chief, uh, police chief, 
chief of police had ordered them to come and get some magazines. <laughs> well, I'm not going to argue with the chief of police, right? So these guys all took off with some magazines, all right? Now, let me, let me emphasize this again. <laughs> right? What they were after was this whole thing with no license plates by Richard McDonald. I mentioned this before, and <laughs> I'll mention it again now. And um, so the magazine lasted uh, four years, and it closed in May of 1997. And it was shortly thereafter my car was stolen. And I was like, oh my God, what do I do? I don't have license plates, so, you know, what do I tell everybody? You know, how do I get my car back? So I rang up Richard McDonald, and he said, just tell him your car was in storage. <laughs> I said, okay. So, yeah, I got my car back uh, with the brick that they had put on the accelerator. So they had run it into the a wall someplace. It had over $2,000 worth of damage. And uh, so my lesson was they're bigger than me. Right? <laughs> and that's how that ended. Um, after that, I had to, uh, I, I put it, the next car I got and put it into a trust. And uh, then the license plates are required in the trust. And I had a trustee, so that was pretty good. Tell us your feelings about Sir Richard James MacDonald. I love him. He's a cranky old guy. <laughs> and, uh, but he taught me some of the most valuable legal information I could ever have gotten. I, uh, I, looking back now, the effort that all of us made to drive without license plates and rescind our driver's license and take up, there was one guy who wanted to drive without a license plate, drive without a driver's license, go 100 miles an hour on the freeway because he wanted to go argue in court about the right to travel. And I just know that it got him into such a huge battle. I don't remember how it came out, but I thought that was the funniest story I'd ever heard. And he kept speeding on the freeway until finally a policeman stopped him at 101 miles an hour. <laughs> no license plate, no driver. So I, the, the argument was that they had no jurisdiction. I don't know if he won. Okay. So one time, Frank and I went to Riverside to a lecture, and there was a lady there with long, long gray hair, and she was probably in her 60s, maybe her 70s. And after we heard the lecture, we sat down and had a, a little talk with her, and she said she'd been attending the alter alternative political meetings for 40 years, uh, so we said, well, what's changed? Have you guys been able to alter anything? And she said, nothing. So I look back at my 20 years, right? And I look back and I say, did I alter anything? Did I change anything? No. Nope. No. Nope. So it's bigger than we think. You and Frank also had a battle with the Department of Justice over the contents of The Art of Passing the Buck, both Volume 1 and Volume 2. Could you please give us some highlights of this brouhaha? Okay. Um, it was announced on the radio throughout Los Angeles that Frank and I were scam trust artists and that the Department of Justice had, you know, or suing us or whatever they were doing. And uh, a, lo a lot of people heard it and they called us on the phone. And I said, well, we haven't been served. That started in August, and we didn't get served till October. And it said on the paperwork they'd tried to serve us three or four times. Well, somebody was always here, so, you know, they didn't try to serve us at all. <laughs> they just decided when they felt like it, they were going to serve us. Anyhow, it was dire. This paperwork was accusing Frank and I of using trust to scam and using trust to hide, to get out of taxes and using trust for this and using trust. I mean, it was really awful. It's still awful. It's still on the internet. You can look it up. 
none of it was true. Not one ounce of it was true. So I turned the paperwork over, or Frank and I turned the paperwork over to two other legal eagles, and uh, they looked at the paperwork and they read it over, and they couldn't stop laughing. They said the paperwork was so ridiculous, it had so many holes in it, it was improperly put together, and it was so funny and so outrageous and so ridiculous that they both were going to jump in and help, help us do the battle. So Frank and I did the battle pro per, and we had not only that particular set of legal e eagles, we had another one in Poland <laughs> who wanted to jump in. So we had three very well-gifted uh, legal people behind us who handled the paperwork for us because there's a whole lot of court protocol one way and the other, you know, they, they sue you and then you respond and then they put the next piece of paper and then you respond. There must be a name for that kind of process, is there, Mr. Legal Eagle? Back and forth. <laughs> okay, it was a back and forth legal process. And uh, they were accusing uh, Frank and I of writing the books. <laughs> we didn't write the books. All they ever had to do, call the copyright office and find out who owned the copyright. Did they? No. Why? Because they're lazy. Or because they are so sure that we are so evil that we would not have had any brains to have put a copyright on it in the name of the trustees of the trust. Charles Arthur owns the copyright. My name's not on it. Frank's not on it. There were ten people, people that wrote these books. Nobody in the right mind could ever put together volume one by themselves. There are whole sections there written by other people. Uh, yeah, I wrote some of it, sure. Even you probably wrote some of it. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> so um, their court case was way off base. The, the back and forth the, uh, paperwork indicated to the judge that they were way off base. And so she determined it should go into discovery. Uh, and our wonderful DOJ attorney, and I mean that seriously, he was a very honest man, very diligent, paid attention to the law, was absolutely flabbergasted that it went into discovery. And I was like, can't you read? <laughs> I didn't write it. <laughs> Frank didn't write it. What are you suing me for writing the book? You know, that's basically what it was, that we were telling people the bad things in the book and stuff. The IRS never once opened up any pages in the book before they laid on that paperwork. And they never opened up any pages in the book after the paperwork went back and forth. I'm sure they had to give it over to somebody else, to somebody else, to somebody else, who would say, yes, they're right, and get it all the way back. <laughs> so. The further we went into the uh, situation, the more ridiculous they looked. And I was beginning to feel kind of sorry for the uh, DOJ attorney because he got himself in the middle of something that was way off base. And I was actually wondering at one time if they had pulled him in on it to embarrass him or something, you know. I, I mean, I had those thoughts. I mean, pardon me. Mr. Attorney, but those were what I was thinking. <laughs> and uh, so uh, in, that, uh, in that discovery process, I, I was in a deposition for six hours over two days. And my knowledge and skill of the uh, uh, whole way of how the, pro the process of the trust and all the legal uh, situation in the trust, the whole thing, uh, was far superior to anyone's knowledge. It, the attorney knew nothing about trusts. When he was finished, I'm sure he learned a lot. <laughs> There's nothing in the book they could take out. Excellent. Now, tell us what the track record was of the Department of Justice in these matters before this case. No, you tell them, because uh, you're the I, one who heard I am it. told 
by reliable sources that the Department of Justice was 99 and 0 in these type of cases before this matter. And of course, after this matter, they were 99 and 1. Tell us about the prison van and the Puerto Rican revelation of the IRS. Okay, I'd been fighting the battle with the uh, IRS, and uh, I played a tape to the judge, and I swear it's not the tape that I had. Somebody switched the tape. Anyway, what was on the tape that made the judge really angry, and so he threw me into the Metropolitan Detention Center <laughs> for a week. And uh, so I got to experience running around with chains, I mean, serious chains. <laughs> in fact, there were so many chains, it was making me laugh. <laughs> At one point, um, I told my friends this, they were horrified, but I think this is in the same day that the Puerto Rican thing happened. So I, I've got chains all over me. I mean, you can't hardly walk. It's, it's ridiculous. And they're going to load me into the van, and there's a couple little steps, and I, I couldn't make the steps. I, and, and there's so many chains, I'm like straight, you know. I can't bend or anything, so I just psh, I fell forward. I thought it was funny. My friends didn't think it was funny at all. But anyway, I ended up getting into the van, and I think it was the same van where this event happened. And uh, they have a little compartment for the girls, and they have a big compartment for the boys. And, and it, it was like a standard white van, you know. I, I don't know how many guys were in the back, but it was like 10, 15, something like that. They were all jammed together. They all had chains on them. And I'm sitting in the little cubicle in the front, and there's a chicken wire between us. And so one of the guys in the back said, uh, what are you here for? And I said, income tax. And there was this rumble in the back and a groan and all this, and somebody said, let me talk to her, let me talk to her. And it was somebody with a Puerto Rican accent. And <laughs> so the whole back of the van, the guys shifted. Ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> you know, and as we're driving from wherever they were taking me to wherever they was going, because, you know, you, you can't really figure out where you're going when you're in a situation like that. You're just so helpless with all these chains. So anyhow, it, they shifted around so that the Puerto Rican guy was on the uh, um, chicken wire so he could talk to me. So we started talking about income tax and Federal Reserve and stuff like this. Well, the funnier thing is that went back in the days of Perceptions magazine was that uh, Bill Cooper's crew in, uh, they, they published a newspaper called Veritas at the time I published Perceptions. And his crew had done the research and his crew had done the research to uh, find out where the headquarters of the IRS were. And this is on the internet, you can look it up. It's also footnoted heavily in volume two uh, that the headquarters of the IRS is in, the, is in Puerto Rico, okay? So uh, the, um, so when the, the shift occurred and the guy shows up from Puerto Rico, I, I kind of got what was going on, right? So he gives me the other part of the information. He says the Federal Reserve Bank is also headquartered in Puerto Rico, all right? <laughs> so you're telling us that the Federal Reserve yeah. of the United States is headquartered in Puerto Rico. Yeah, right. So, so we had this neat little conversation, and the other guys were all listening. You know, everybody has big ears, because he and I really knew the nitty-gritty of what was going on. And... Uh, he was very proud, very, very proud. He was from Puerto Rico. He's a bank robber from Puerto Rico because they hate the Federal Reserve Bank and he'll, he will um, rob banks for the rest of his life. I understand that the Department of Justice was very concerned about Puerto Rico. Please tell us why they might have wanted it removed from the books. They wanted it removed from the uh, volume two because uh, they said they were like uh, wet hens. They were all upset. No, the IRS is not headquartered in Puerto Rico. And the big footnote at the bottom uh, in the book tells you exactly where the information comes from. So 
I'm like, why are they having such a problem? <laughs> it's all these executive orders or whatever, EOs or whatever. And uh, so, uh, so all that stuff I told you about, uh, the chains and everything, that it was so funny. Uh, is when this came up with the book, I knew for sure <laughs> the IRS was headquartered in Puerto Rico because of the guy who was the bank robber. So not only did I get it from, from Bill Cooper, I got it from a bank robber. <laughs> so that was why I, we told the story. I forgot to say that. Of course, when you get um, volume two, that is in there. That remained. They could not take it out. Tell us about the Federal, Azure, Re Federal Rule of Civil Procedure, Rule 26, Discovery and Specificity. Well, this is where a lot of the information that the IRS had put, this bogus information. If you, if you really want to see how never to do a, a paperwork, <laughs> go on the Internet. There's these broad allegations and these name-calling and all of this, and there was no reference to what they were talking about. So uh, in our paperwork, we told them, you know, Rule 26, be specific. <laughs> well, they're... A big paperwork stack just went down to almost zero. You can see where the big paperwork stack went. When you go on to the PassingBucks.com website and there's a tab that says Win versus DOJ and I think it's eight pages for the paperwork and then the rest of it, of it is attachments. Not anything in there accuses us of anything. It just tries to get us to agree to not put trust together. Well, Frank and I had already, we, we already quit putting trust together about a year before this all happened. So, you know, they didn't get anything. All right. Was anything removed from the books as part of the settlement? Big two pages in the back mm -hmm. on, based on commercial speech. They were two ads, and oddly enough, they're on the website as part of the documents of the permanent in injunction so I will, my, so evil Gwen will not make any more common law trusts, which were totally legal to begin with. <laughs> Is using the common law or private trust dangerous, difficult, or simply different? Oh, it's dangerous. If you do it wrong, you'll lose your assets. You have to have two trustees. You have to make sure the settler doesn't sign anything. You have to only pay out of the trust account, trust expenses. You can't make any of, you can't use the trust account for personal. You have to know what you're doing. You have to know what you're doing. You have to fill out all kinds of paperwork correctly. You have to understand jurisdiction. You have to know past court cases. You have to know what you're doing. That's how I, you know, six hour deposition, I knew what I was doing. If you can handle a six-hour de deposition and not make any mistakes, then you're doing good. If I'd have made one mistake, there would not be a book available. They kept taking things off the table. <laughs> tell us about the distinction between income and corpus in the private trust. I'll tell you what it says in the uh, Internal Revenue Code. It says if you're a settler of a trust, you can choose between income and corpus for what comes into a trust, no matter how broadly interpreted. This is in IRC 674, Section 8. Right? Well, I showed it to you the yes. other day. Right. Today. This I showed morning. It to you this morning. Yes. It's right there. It's all in the uh, other powers that the settler can retain. Uh, when he sets up a irrevocable trust, same thing. It's all in that section. You've talked about trust capital units. Give us some more discussion about trust capital units, please. When you exchange anything into a common law trust, you get trust capital units for the exchange. They are a piece of the corpus. And if the trust cashes out, you get a piece of the corpus like I did on the remainder man, makes you automatically a remainder man. <laughs> you might say it's the same thing in a different format. 
You've also mentioned uni units of beneficial interest. Would you please compare and contrast trust capital units and units of beneficial interest? Units of beneficial interest are uh, distributed from the gain of the trust. Uh, and they can also be sold as securities. I think it's uh, Mitsubishi Iron Works sells UBIs as, their, as securities on the stock exchange. We have the footnote in volume one. Okay. Please talk about the distribution of wealth and how the trust, the private trust, handles that. Well, the beneficiaries each have trust capital units. You can also use trust capital units as a percentage of what they get. It's too hard in a regular sized trust to have a, uh, to, to operate both UBIs and TCUs. You have to get into a really big trust to do that because it takes a tremendous amount of administration. So anyhow, the beneficiaries can get a percentage of uh, the gain of the trust based on their TCUs. Please tell us about the Lewis Cass Pasteur Trust from the Art of Passing the Buck, Volume 1. Uh, that trust is uh, allegedly from the descendant of uh, Marie Anto Antoinette. Uh, he's um, Louis Caspasior, uh, allegedly came from England to America and set up this trust for the royals. And uh, it was to own all the railroads and to own all the utilities and to own everything that they could possibly own so they control. America, <laughs> period. <laughs> Anyhow, the trust, trustees were so corrupt, they lost control of the trust. But the original trust capital units were discovered in a vault, and uh, the uh, beneficiaries of those TCUs have been identified, and they are uh, suing in an Article Three court to get their share of the wealth. But the trust is so discombobulated that no, our, there's no paperwork to be able to uh, substantiate anything. So it's all it's tangled up. Bad administration, corrupt trustees, so on and so forth. So I'm hearing a, we have a forensic bookkeeping nightmare. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's what it would be if there were books they could find. Tell us more about the pra practice of checkerboarding in the Lewis Cass Pesor Trust? Well, this is a legal way that they sold the uh, land next to the railroads. It was a checkerboard pattern on e either side, 10 miles square. And so the trust owned the every other checkerboard. Okay. Explain exactly how a private trust builds family synergy, and if you wish, use a fairy example. <laughs> a fairy example. I'll leave that to the other video. But uh, uh, if you've got a million dollars and you're starting a trust and you're telling your family, I'm starting a trust, uh, you're going to get a lot of initial support. They're going to glob onto your trust. It's like starting a business, same thing. When I started Perceptions Magazine, I said I had the money, I'm going to start a trust. Everybody globbed on, OK? It's the same thing with a big money trust. So not the same thing with a small trust, a middle class trust trying to do this kind of setup. You have to build your momentum. You have to get your, tr your um, family to support you. If you can get your aunts and uncles and your mother and your father to jump in on the trust, you're going to have a million dollar trust to start, okay? But th they're not going to do it because they don't have the education. They don't understand what it's all about. Uh, but it causes cohesion when you have a trust that's giving out a, a distribution. Uh, you know, in the Rothschild Trust, if they say anything or talk anything about the trust or even admit their beneficiaries, they'll lose their distribution. <laughs> Causes cohesion, you know, cohesion. Okay, does that make sense? So a trust obtains family loyalty by providing benefits to its beneficiaries. Yeah, and if you do it right, your beneficiaries become an army of support. Most, most beneficiaries don't pay any attention. They just get their money and run. <laughs> Certainly, 
our audience can understand how these large private trusts will benefit America's wealthiest, and the world's wealthiest families, tell us how private trusts can be used by those of more modest wealth. Well, you have the same power to build the wealth. You don't have any power to build the wealth if you have no cohesion. The building wealth has to do with agreement. Cohesion has to do with being able to communicate with each other. In a uh, smaller trust, you have to have the cohesion before you can build a trust. And once you get enough agreement, everybody starts piling in with their money or they're, you know, here, let me add this and let me add this and so on and so forth. Then you have agreement, then you can build your wealth. You're going to find out if you try to do a common law trust, agreement is going to be your pro biggest problem. Therefore, we have discovered skip the first generation and go to the second generation. Make the children the beneficiaries. Forget about your kids. Your kids are probably way off over in Arkansas or over in Europe having their own life and, they, and they've since disconnected from the parents a long time ago and they could care less if their parents put together a trust or not. But if you make their children the beneficiary, you're going to get their attention. How much and what types of resources does it take to actually get started with a private trust? Charles Arthur is a private trust. We will not uh, argue that point. <laughs> we started with nothing. Everybody uh, piled in. Everybody gave us the information for free. Uh, we gave them capital units in case the trust ever got big enough to have a profit. And we borrowed the six thousand dollars to get it to get the uh, money uh, for the publishing. We've since been able to pay back a lot of stuff since then. But you can start a, tr a private trust without anything. With zip, you have to have agreement. So don't anybody tell me I can't do it because I don't have the money. That's why the book, the second book. You know, the first book is forty dollars. The second one is five hundred. If you don't have five hundred dollars, you don't have enough oomph to start the trust, to start a trust or do it. That five hundred dollars is really all you need. <laughs> I mean, seriously, how to do it is in volume two. So I'm hearing the best ways to get started is to buy and read volume one of the Art of Passing the Buck. Yeah, that's the point. You need to understand what you're getting into and whether you want a common law trust or not. Tell us a little bit more about Sir Richard James MacDonald. Didn't I tell you something about him? Any more you'd like to say about him? Uh, he, uh, he went to prison for 17 months. He sued the Federal Reserve Bank. Do you know this about him? Please tell us. <laughs> Did you know it? I've heard this. Tell, tell us the story. Let's see if it, it resonates. <laughs> He sued the Federal Reserve Bank for grand theft of citizenship. And when he got to court, it was just him. And 35 lawyers showed up. And they put him in jail for uh, failure to file for a tax refund. <laughs> I got this from his own mouth. <laughs> so that's what, how he went to prison. Wow. <laughs> Tell us a little bit more about Perceptions Magazine. That was a major part of your life. Government, health, and metaphysics. It's the most dangerous combination you could possibly think of. Of course, I know that now. I didn't know it back then. I, I didn't know I was doing I thought I was helping people and educating people, and I thought that, you know, that this was really a, a really hot thing. It was a hot thing. Uh, the stewardesses on airlines would fly in from Europe and they would load up on Perceptions magazine and they would take them back to Europe and people, we were getting calls from Europe on what was going on. I found out later that I was in a prison world and <laughs> I wasn't supposed to be doing things like that and uh, it, it, it was insane. I lived through it, you know. We had three disruptors come into the magazine, try to destroy it. Uh, three disruptors. <laughs> One usually will do it, but we had too much cohesion, right? They couldn't break us. 
We had one uh, disruptor who used to go into the sales department, the advertising department, and try to get them to fight with each, with each other. And she succeeded twice. And then the sales department came in to me and said, you know, we've got to you know, handle this. And I said, she's a disruptor. She was, works for the CIA. I said, uh, this is how you handle it. And I said, no matter what she says, say nothing. <laughs> it was great. It worked perfectly. Our CIA agent quit a couple weeks later. She had failed in her mission. Oh, well. <laughs> and is there anything else you'd wish to add to what you've said in our conversation? Oh, that disruptor went into Bo Greit's uh, campaign and pulled it apart. You know, these people are, and later I, I met her at a uh, expo and uh, she told me she knew exactly what she was doing. I always wondered if they knew what they were doing. I always thought they were like on autopilot or something. These people are crazy. I've since run into several disruptors. They are really nasty, really nasty. They will do anything they can to rip you apart and separate you from other people. All right, anything uh, else? Well, what's the best way to deal with disruptors since they seem to be common? Uh, do not respond. Know what they're doing. I had one call me on the phone the other day, not the other day, maybe about three or four months ago, and um, she started bad-mouthing the person she works for to denigrate the other person in front of me, right? That's a sure sign of a disruptor. Absolutely big red flag. You know exactly who she is, right? She's trying to separate me from this other person and make me think this other person is low. No, I think you're low for doing that, <laughs> you know. But most people aren't savvy about that. They haven't run into it as much as I have run into it a lot. Thank you so much. We appreciate the time you spent with us telling us more about the Common Law Trust, also as a private trust, The Art of Passing the Buck, Volume 1, and The Art of Passing the Buck, Volume 2, and more information available on the website, www.passingbucks.com from the art of passing the buck. From Charles Arthur. From Charles Arthur Enterprises. Trust. Yes. <laughs>